Hi. I'm going to hold this because it's, it's not high enough. <sighs> I have that problem. Um, we can go back. They stole my picture off my Facebook profile there. <clears throat> my name is Steve, and um, yeah, I'm not going to give you a long list of why I'm qualified to stand up here because it doesn't really matter. If you're impressed with somebody's credentials and you'll only listen to them that way, then you're at the wrong conference. Um, ideally, this is an idea conference, and then I'll either say something that's worth listening to or not. So hopefully it's the former. And it shouldn't matter what my degree is or what anything else is, but um, basically I've been asked to consolidate 40 years worth of my own life studies into 45 minutes, so it's going to be an overview. I can't go into as much detail as I'd like to on any of these topics, but um, hopefully you'll understand where I'm coming from and, and going to. <clears throat> I know that it's easy sometimes to think, maybe I'm wrong. There's so many voices out there that are saying so many things with so much confidence that, that maybe, maybe I just don't know. Um, there's a lot of people who like to lie with a lot of confidence, too. And so, um, you know, a question that I get over and over and over is, uh, how is it that you can be a Jesus freak and a science guy? And so that's really what I'm going to answer today. So most people, they look at science versus religion, and they think, this is the battle. We're going to have a big rumble here. And in reality, it's, it's not. So the stuff I have over there is really more just mental notes for me. So it's not that big of a deal. But in the media, yeah, they like to portray people who believe in a God as anti-science. And as people who, you know, they, they don't believe in science, but they like their iPhones. And, and they like this sort of thing. And they act like there's no way that the two are compatible at all. And in reality, what believers do is we have a different worldview. And that different worldview just means that there are a couple small aspects of science that we question and think that the data is not as conclusive as people like to make it seem. And so <clears throat> it's really rejecting those specific things. The bulk of science we love, the bulk of science we use, the bulk of science is fun and applicable and fits in perfectly with everything that God has done. And so we like that sort of thing. In fact, if you look through history, you find that the, all the preconditions for the scientific revolution were there in several cultures as they rose and fell throughout history. But they never came about, even though all the conditions were right for it. But the one condition that they were missing was that framework that there is a personal God who is rational. And so he is rule-governed, and he's made a rule-governed universe. And so we should be able to look and see these rules that are there. Newton said he loved to learn about science because he was thinking God's thoughts after him. Um, <clears throat> so the previous, um, what do you call them, civilizations, um, they basically thought the world was just too bizarre to understand and that there couldn't be any rules to it, and it was just too hard to understand. And now we see a lot more rules. And again, the rules are there because we believe in that rational God who, who is a rule maker. Um, early scientists, they were all believers. Isaac Newton, like I mentioned earlier, um, he was a major theologian. He actually wrote more things on theology than he wrote on science. He was especially fascinated with end time stuff, which I think is kind of fun to study too. And several of you have been through my studies on end time, so those are kind of fun. Other people kind of tend to think that atheists suddenly arrived on the scene in the last 50 years, and, and just because you see a rise in atheism here in America doesn't mean that atheists haven't always been around. No matter where you go in history, you will find that people didn't believe that there was a God, and other people did believe that there's God, and people have a whole sorts of twisted views of what God is. Um, so what happens is now we have the people who are atheistic, who really rally to the side of science. And why is it that they're excited about science? 
And the point is that their worldview purports to explain the entirety of existence without a God. And so they say everything just happened completely naturally. And so they have a framework that we call naturalism. And so we all have this idea that there's this objective scientist. And this objective scientist only listens to facts and logic. And he only believes what he can see and measure. He instantly turns from a previous idea to a new one when confronted with opposing information. And we've got the phrase that comes from an actual scientist that I respect. A million experiments cannot prove me correct. A single experiment can prove me wrong. That's a pretty good scientific attitude. But the objective scientist that we've listed here doesn't exist. I've worked with lots of scientists, and I've read a lot of stuff from scientists, and it turns out that scientists are actually people. Weird, right? And so since scientists are human, then <clears throat> they're kind of like politicians. There are politicians out there that actually went into politics to serve. Is that the majority of them? Sadly, no. Um, same thing with scientists. There are scientists that really, really work and recognize that they have a bias that they're coming into, and they work really hard to say that this bias is not going to affect them. And then you have others that are out there, and they're literally angry at God, and they're out there to, you know, cure everybody from this God delusion, which is actually the name of a scientific book, supposedly. Anyway, most people from all sides fall prey to this, and so I have this little cartoon for you that I really like. Well, look here, a big yellow butterfly. It's unusual to see one of these this time of year, unless, of course, he flew up from Brazil. I'll bet that's it. They do that sometimes, you know. They fly up from Brazil, and they... This is no butterfly. This is a potato chip. Well, I'll be. So it is. I wonder how a potato chip got all the way up here from Brazil. And this is our problem. We, we have these preconceived notions that are so ingrained in our head that when the new information comes, we don't reject the old and grab onto the new. We say, how, do, how can I force it into the old? And the problem is, this isn't something that's unique only to their side. It's also unique to our side. And so we have to be careful about that. Worldviews. I'm going to talk a little bit about worldviews. It's going to come up later today also. Um, worldview is the framework through which you filter all your experiences. And a lot of people don't even realize that they have a worldview. The typical outspoken scientist has a worldview that we call naturalism. They believe that the natural world is all there is, all that's ever been, all that ever will be. That's a direct quote. Um, and that's their framework. And so if it doesn't fit within that framework, then anything is rejected. And it doesn't matter if it's like a foot in a glove, they still say it fits. And so that's kind of the way that it works for them. We have a God-centered view. If you're a believer, then within your framework, you say, yes, there is a creator God, and he created the entire world and designed it, and we see all that evidence of stuff. There are many people out there that, again, they don't know what their framework is. They don't even know that there is a framework. This may be the first time that you've ever thought about the fact that you have a worldview. That's good. You should be thinking <laughs> it's something that all of us should be doing, um, is analyzing what we're doing. We have this idea of open-mindedness. You can't learn anything if your mind is closed. I'm a school teacher. Every once in a while, I get a kid that knows everything already. And he comes in my room, and, and it, he's very difficult to teach because he's always got his mind made up about everything. And, and that's hard. C.S. Lewis said, there are many ways to look at things until you know the truth. Then there's never more than one. That's a pretty good idea about open-mindedness. But <clears throat> Carl Sagan was the one that I quoted earlier. The natural world is all there is, all that ever was, and all that ever will be. That tells you, is he open-minded? <clears throat> no, he's no more open-minded than C.S. Lewis is. Is Carl Sagan's sta statement a statement of fact, or is it a statement of his worldview? See, there's a difference there. He's stating that these are the conditions that he believes in. 
has he offered any proof for that? Is there any proof that the natural world is all that there is? And so we have a lot of scientists that are out there, and that is their underpinning. And if they believe that completely true, then it's like, well, what if God appeared right in front of you? Well, then I think I was hallucinating. You know, and there's no amount of proof that would ever get them to be convinced. And so they're not open-minded in the least. Stephen Hawking. I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. Therefore. And again, is that a statement of faith? Or is that something that can be proven? Well, Hawking can probably prove that now. Because he died recently, and so he knows what the afterlife is. <clears throat> now, if Stephen Hawking is wrong, which I think he is, then he's in for a rude awakening. Or... <sighs> anyway, um, most people tend to be very impressed by somebody who's famous who says something. So if, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson says quippy things and everybody likes to quote him because he sounds real cool, you know, and then you put the name of it and you say, well, Einstein said this, and everybody goes, ooh, because, you know, Einstein was smart. And so people get really impressed with, well, this person is smarter than I am, so therefore, um, again, it, if they're not actually giving you any facts to go with what they're talking about, then what they're talking about is just their opinion, and they're just trying to brainwash you. And, and again, most of science doesn't need brainwashing. You look at what are the areas that they really pound, 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 pound on. And it tends to be that where did all the stuff... Well, we'll get into it in a second here. Here's our options. There are two of them. Everything did happen naturally or things happen supernaturally. Those are our only two options. It either happened naturally or it happened supernaturally. So now what we have to do is look at the evidence and we have to say, well, which one actually fits the data better? So if we state from the beginning, like Carl Sagan does, that the supernatural doesn't exist. So if you say it doesn't exist from the beginning, then, gee, I guess it doesn't exist. So, and that's what they do, is they just make that statement and they go from there. But the problem with logic is, any conclusion that started from an invalid premise, no matter how good your logic is, no matter how many good experiments you place on that invalid premise, if your premise is invalid, then everything coming from that is invalid. And so we have issues that come with that. Um, it really comes down to the weight of evidence. Does a supernatural explanation make more sense than a natural explanation does? And this is where I always tell people that a supernatural explanation is like a hand in a glove. And a naturalistic one is more like a foot in a glove. There are five wiggly things. They don't quite fit. Um, and that's what I see the evidence at. And I've done a lot of these. So which worldview is superior? Well, we have to answer some questions. Where did all the stuff come from? we got a lot of mass energy out there. Um, how did life arrive from non-life? Is there a purpose to life? Why is there evil? Are we alone? Does anything matter? Um, science can kind of maybe answer the are we alone question. At least they're desperately trying. And so they're constantly looking for that one. But when you look at these are the big questions that people ask. And the big questions that science asks. And at least the first couple are true science questions. The other ones aren't exactly science. It's more of a search for truth. And with me, that was me. I, my whole life, I, I look for truth. I would rather hear truth than a sugar-coated lie. I'm that type of person. I like to seek out the truth. And so when I engage in debates with people, it, it tends to just be, are, are we going to look for truth? Now, I had a kid a few years back, um, and he used to love to debate with me. And we would argue through different things, and then he would lose the argument. And he would, and so then he'd go argue with other people, um, and then they would bring him back to me, and we'd go through it, and we'd go through it, and there'd always be a point where he goes, and I see my case is getting weaker, 
And I would always ask him, okay, now that you've been convinced over and over and over that your worldview is wrong, are you going to change your worldview? And he wouldn't. So, again, not everybody is actually a seeker of truth. So that's the point I'm getting at. If there is no truth, and there's a lot of people that are going to tell you that, there is no truth. Everything is relative, and what's true for you isn't true for me. I have a hard time with that from a scientific point of view. If there is no truth, then there's no point to science, that's for sure. But there's no point to this conversation, there's no point to having this conference, there's no point to anything. But the point is, we, we like to argue, we like to debate through things, we like to see if we can come to an answer. We like to see this stuff. If there is no truth, then there's no purpose of having laws, there's no purpose of having legal system, and there's no purpose in having anything. But but this is what people are going to try and tell you, is that, no, there's there's not really truth out there. And, and I don't even think that they believe that, because why would they argue? If you argue and you want to debate and you want to learn something, then you're, you're seeking for truth. And so I think we all do believe in truth is the problem. But here's the problem. Are we honest enough to actually go where the facts and logic lead? Now, sometimes it can be scary because you think, well, what if I find out something I don't want to find out? Well, I find that out all the time when I read the Bible, too. <laughs> what if I find out stuff that God wants me to do that's scary, that I don't want to do, that I'm not comfortable doing, that I have to give up? I'm more interested in knowing the truth. I want to know what's real. Um, so, do we live in self-delusion and faith? And again, that can't happen on our side, but... I've already pointed out, Carl Sagan is completely deluded before he died also and found out the truth. Um, if there's no amount of proof that could possibly sway you, then you're not a truth seeker, you're indoctrinated. Okay, so that's, that's a really nice thing. And again, it works on both sides. We have people who are religious that there's no amount of evidence that could ever persuade them. And there are people on the other side that are irreligious, that no amount of evidence would ever persuade them. And at that point, you're, you're indoctrinated. You're not looking for truth. You're not looking for where do the facts actually lead. So most people I have found are not looking for truth. They're looking for an excuse. Most people that I know that are atheistic are angry. They're angry at God. And it's hard to say I can be angry at somebody I don't believe in, but when you see their life and you see that the way that they do things and they see the things that they argue, there's a big fight and there's an argument. And, and most people know they're looking for, hey, somebody that I am impressed with said this thing and therefore I don't believe it. And you'll have people that are posting all kinds of stuff on the internet. You know, I totally reject Christianity because X, Y, or Z. And they have this one reason that they reject everything, and it's like, well, I can give you a logical explanation for that. No, not interested. I've got my excuse. And so I, that's what I find most people are at. So anyway, there are limits of science. Science is great when it can accurately predict what is of value. We have a lot of fun with projectile motion in my class. I have these cool projectile launchers, and we get to shoot things all over the place, and they have to predict exactly where it's going to land in this lab, and, and it's great fun. And, and we time things, and I tell them, look, you know, this projectile is in the air for 1.5 seconds. We can pick any time we want and know exactly where it's going to be. And so we time it, and we calculate how far over and how far up it's going to be. And I stand over there, and I've got a little timer on me so that it's going to hit there and stop the timer. And... And I say, it should hit me right here. And boom, it hits me right here. And everybody's like, oh, that's so cool. Because science is cool. And I really enjoy physics. And so when we can do stuff like that, we can predict stuff, and we can accurately predict what we say we're doing, then, then science has a whole lot of value to it. But we've got a lot of science that doesn't. We have science that's hard science, and we have softer and softer and softer and softer sciences. And it seems like the softer sciences are the ones that scream the most you find more of the atheists on the softer end and fewer of the atheists on the hard end of science. In physicists, you don't see a whole lot of atheists. You see a whole lot of guys that go, oh, I'm not really sure, even though everybody around them is screaming that. So science that looks back has problems. 
if we look at a past event that nobody was around to witness, now we have to look at there's no direct evidence. Everything is indirect evidence. So it's all open to interpretation. So how do you interpret it? And again, if your framework is everything has to have a naturalistic explanation, then no matter how good the explanation is, you're going to reject it. And so people don't like that. Um, even if you can show something experimentally, let's pretend we could create life in a lab, which nobody has. Probably nobody ever will be. But if we could create life from non-life in a lab, that just proves that it could have happened that way. It doesn't prove that it did happen that way. And so anything that happens in the past, we have a problem with because objectively we weren't there to witness it. And so again, everything is open to interpretation as far as that goes. And the problem is, if we can't show it experimentally, it gets to the point where they don't even try. When it comes to evolutionary theory, it is so ingrained in the scientific culture that now they don't even run experiments. A Nobel Prize was given out a couple of years ago to a woman who was just home with her kids and she had an idea of why something would work. And so if you can make up a just so story that fits and makes some logical sense of why something should have happened evolutionarily, that's the way it happened. And so you don't even run an experiment, you just come up with these ideas that, yeah, well, I think this evolved because of this, and this makes logical sense, and everybody claps and says, yeah, our side is winning. Um, and it kind of becomes that way, and it's, it's kind of scary. So let's get down to me. Why do I believe what I believe? I've been at this for a long, long time, and I still am on one side. Basically, I don't have the faith needed to be an atheist. I look at the evidence and I say I have the faith needed to be a follower of Jesus. There's a lot of good evidence for that, even though people will shout and scream, there's no evidence Jesus even existed. And people actually make statements like this, which are, wow, demonstrably false. But... I seek truth and not indoctrination, so that's my worldview. I, I want to know what the truth is and how the facts match up. I also look at what are the ramifications of my worldview. And so I say, how does, my, how does the worldview of both sides play out? How does it make the world around me work? And so um, looking at that, um, if I'm going to be an atheist, I have to believe that stuff with these are always here, and we see the universe, and the universe appears to be slowing down. We appear to be approaching energy death, and everything is going that direction. So if all energy is approaching toward energy death, then we must have had a point in the past where it was more. And so if it's always been here, or if it came from where, and so then lots of scientists, of course, look at that and say, well, so the universe had a start. Okay, so if the universe had a start, where did the stuff come from? So we have all this mass energy that came from somewhere, even though everything in science says that mass energy doesn't get destroyed. It's all a constant. It shifts around in type and form, but it's always there. And so then we have to look at this and say, well, where did it come from? And there are actually scientists who propose that there is outside of our universe some universe-making machine that is popping out universes right and left, and the ones that don't work die and disappear, and the ones that did work, like ours, are there. And so they think that there might be lots and lots of universes out there that we just can't get to. Um, scientific statement or faith statement? Tremendous faith statement. Stupid faith statement. <laughs> Who made the machine that made the machine that makes the machine? <sighs> And you get to the point of absolute absurdity. What is this machine? Who made this machine? How does this machine work? It, these are serious scientists. That's the scary part. Um, I have to believe that the universe only looks like it was amazingly well designed, but it really isn't. There are top scientists who make books like this that literally are there to convince you that even though this is exactly what it looks like, it's false. That's what they're telling you. Um, kind of scary. 
when you study physics, you study the universe and you study the fact that there are these constants that are within the universe. And it's really interesting. You read these books that say, hey, if this constant was tweaked just this much, like 27 digits down, life wouldn't work. The universe wouldn't work the way it works. All these things, there's a bunch of different constants that are timed out to incredible precision that have to work the way they work. And so you say, well, gee, we just got really, really lucky. Or <laughs> there's a designer. <clears throat> it's crazy. Um, life stuff. I have to believe that life just spontaneously happens. Everything in biology teaches us that life only comes from life. Life is so incredibly complex that if we had all the supercomputers and all the scientific geniuses in the world trying to program these supercomputers to keep a mythical cell alive, they wouldn't be able to do it. But the cell does it all by itself really, really well, all the time. And people look at that and don't see design. They just say, wow, random chance in time, and this works. And to me, it makes a lot more sense to say, hey, if life only comes from life, I have to believe that all this matter just spontaneously showed up and it coalesced just right, even though that works against everything I know about the way energy works and the, how things explode instead of form. I have to believe that all these macromolecules were growing more and more and more complex in an environment that is devoid of oxygen, even though it needs water. And can't possibly, it, it just gets to the point of absurdity. And again, some of this, you're like pulsing, you're babbling. Um, I can talk about it more in detail with you if you're a life science major and, and you want to understand some of this in more detail and the rest of you are just like, uh, I don't even care. <laughs> I understand, I had some of you in class. Um, <clears throat> God describes a universe where everything was created according to its kind and it reproduces according to its kind. And so we would expect from that that we would see a fossil record that shows pretty much stasis. And we look at the fossil record and we see something enters into the fossil record, goes through the fossil record, and then either continues into the present day or disappears with minor variations, and that's it. And so we take all these straight lines and then we connect them with these mythical lines and we create the tree of life. And we say, hey, this is pretty, but all the things connecting it aren't there. And so when I was in college, way, way back in ancient history, um, they were already going through a crisis. And the big thing back then was they were realizing that natural selection wasn't really a good mechanism for this because natural selection is really good at, at weeding out the weird stuff. But keeping in the normal. And so they were coming up with ideas called punctuated equilibrium. This was, this was what was in vogue back when I was in college. And punctuated equilibrium basically says, um, we don't see any change in the fossil record. Therefore, when evolution happens, it happens so fast that it doesn't enter into the fossil record. So we shouldn't expect to see it. You know, that's flawless science there. Um, and again, these are top minds in the field. And it's disappointing as a scientist to see stuff like that even be there. But they're so committed to their worldview that nothing is going to make them change. And so that's not what I see. Um, also with the fossil record, people always like to make a story about human fossils coming from apes because that, that's where the money is. But... <clears throat> So they look at stuff where you have very, very few fossils because then you can tell the story real well. Well, the animals that get fossilized the easiest are the shelled creatures that get buried easily. We have billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of crinoid fossils all over the place. And so you'd say, well, if anywhere we have a most complete record anywhere, it would be right there. Nobody ever tries to teach evolution from crinoids. Interesting. Um, I have to believe in beneficial mutations. Most mutations are not beneficial. In fact, scientists are constantly looking for this beneficial mutation because the entire idea of life spontaneously coming from one cell and then turning into everything that we know it is 
requires billions and billions and billions of these beneficial mutations. And so far we've found um, 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 none. But they have to be there because life is here. So we, we got here and, and that's the only explanation is that beneficial mutations are here and, and they work to our advantage. Even though, because that's the only explanation because of our worldview. So I have to believe in small discrete steps of incredibly intertwined processes occurring together, but completely randomly and completely without an engineer behind it. Now we have astrophysicists that are looking throughout the world and they're looking for any sign of life anywhere else in the universe. And back about a hundred years ago, they saw pulses of energy coming and they were coming in a nice regular repeating pattern and they thought, ha, huh, this is a signal. This is proof of life. Well, now we call, call them quasars. But quasars are rapidly spinning neutron stars and they, they give off energy in pulses because of the way that they're spinning. But quasars are all designated by the letters LGM and then a number. LGM stands for little green men because when they first found them, they were convinced that this was a sign of life. So they say something that's as small as that and they say, wow, that's proof that there's intelligence out there trying to communicate with us. But yet you look at the incredible design that is in the world, and we spend all this time saying, oh, it's just random chance. And so I love nature shows. And I watch these nature shows, and I find out incredible information about these animals and how they fit in their environment. And I look at it, and I think, this is so fascinating. And then they spend 15 minutes out of the hour segment showing us how this probably evolved from some animal that looks completely different that just happened to be in the area sometime nearby, which adds nothing to the actual program. We could spend just as much of that 15 minutes saying, isn't it incredible the way God designed the life to interwork together and fit in its environment absolutely perfectly? And we could spend the exact same time doing that and see the exact same stuff and which one actually fits the data better, which one, yeah. Metaphysics. This is where it comes into fun stuff because we don't, no scientist lives his life in a scientific world. I create, I'm personal, I yearn for truth and beauty. Um, we create, give a kid a crayon, what does he want to do? Draw on the walls. Look at my artwork, mommy. And you're so excited to scrub that off the wall. And you want to leave it there for at least a week so he's happy, right? Um, we try and create all the time. That's, that's our nature. We are designed to be designers. It's crazy. We are personal. We, we love beauty. Why do we look at things and say, wow, that's amazing? We see a sunset, we see a sunrise, and we go, wow. We see the flowers, and we say, wow. We see these nature shows, and we say, wow. Why do we say, wow? Now, I have a food drive. I get hungry. You know what? There's food. I have a sex drive. There's actually a cure for that. How many of you seek truth? How many of you seek justice? How many of you know when a wrong is a wrong and it's just wrong? Okay. How many of you recognize that there is evil? Now, let's think about this. If this is a completely naturalistic world, and we got here because of natural selection, then natural selection is our friend, and death, doom, and destruction are our friends because those are the agents of creation. And so there shouldn't be evil because if a bunch of people die, well, good. The survivors must be the fittest, you know, because we know who the fittest are. They're the ones who survive, but which ones survive? The fittest, you know, because it's not circular reasoning. Um, how many of you feel like life has a purpose? You may not know what that purpose is, but you feel like life should have a purpose. It should have meaning. And I think everybody has this gnawing desire that there's more to life than just eating, breathing, breeding, continuing the species. There's more to life than that. And so these metaphysical questions basically have 
really despairing answers if you come from a naturalistic point of view. And when you see people who are honest about it, they may not be honest about being willing to change their worldview, but when they're honest about that, yeah, they're depressing people to be around. <laughs> really depressing people to be around. But you're asking, but 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 analogous features. You look at a bat's arm, and 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 you look at a whale's arm, and you look at your arm, and they're similar bones. So that proves evolution, right? And and you know, you and a banana have eighty percent of the same DNA. You realize a banana has cells, right? And if you took cell biology, you learned about you know ribosomes and mitochondria and Golgi apparatus and all those fun things. Um, all the DNA has instructions for how to make those and how to make those work. And everything in life has to have that same pattern. So, yeah, you and your banana are going to have a lot of the same DNA. And that's good because, um, yeah. Cars. I can take every model of car and I can draw a beautiful phylogenic tree of how cars evolved. I can show you exactly how cars evolved and I can tell you what processes were forcing, you know, cars back in the 60s were big and bold and powerful, but then we had the energy crisis and that, you know, was a force that caused cars suddenly, suddenly stick shift cars became very popular back in the 80s and then energy efficient cars and more aerodynamic cars and it's all there because of evolutionary pressures, right? And so I can draw you a beautiful tree of life of cars. I can do the same thing with tools. We can take screws and nails, and I can stick every nail and screw and fastening device in the world, and I can draw a beautiful tree of life from it. And I can show you which ones are related and how they're related. But again, all these things were designed by somebody for a specific purpose, and even though we can imply the same external mechanism on them, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice story. So how else would a designer design something? If I'm designing life, would I want to make every single thing of life so completely different than anything else that I can't get any nutrients and I can't get any, anything from the other things? Or am I going to design life to everything work together nicely? So yeah, the genetic plan is going to be redone, just like when I'm designing cars. I don't start over from scratch when I'm making a new model. I take the old model and say, how do I make it better? That's fine. But I don't start from scratch with every single new car. This is the way designers design things. And so we have a great designer. When I was a kid, there was this amazing fish called the coelacanth. And the coelacanth was a fish. It's a lobe fin fish, which means it, it has two big fins in the front and two big fins in the back that kind of look like legs. And he was the hypothetical um, ancestor of the amphibians. And so they thought, coelacanth, yeah, this thing is going to be the one that, that shows how everything just crawled onto land because this would be great for walking on. <sighs> Problem is in the 60s or 70s, I think it was in the 60s, um, somebody caught a coelacanth, something that had been dead for 500 million years. And they found one. And it wasn't something that lived real near the shallow waters and could crawl in and out. It was something that lived very deep and didn't use those lobes at all like they figured that they were going to use them. I'm from Nebraska, and so I like Nebraska Man. Back in the 30s, Nebraska Man was an entire race of people that was theorized based on one tooth that was found. Later they found that tooth stuck to the skull of an extinct pig Later, they found a whole herd of living pigs that had that tooth to it. So I'm just saying sometimes things are said and made and are popularized that later you look back on and just chuckle about, whereas the story that I get isn't. So I get people that say, well, God is just to cover the gaps. Everybody just says, you know, wave the magic wand, God did it. And so that leads to no scientific thought. So you're telling me that because, okay, dogs. 
we have dogs. There's lots of different types of dogs. All the species of dogs have been developed in the last about 200 years. So we've got lots of species of dogs. Are they all different species or are they the same species? They're the same species. They're all dogs. We've got some that are huge and we've got some that are tiny and we made all that from the genetic diversity that's within a dog and by specific breeding. And so people look at something like what we do with dogs and just say, well, okay, so if I see within a dog that stays a dog, I can get this much diversity then, therefore, boom, this happened with all life and I can connect everything. And again, the fossil record doesn't match, the DNA doesn't match, there's a lot of things that don't match that thing, but they just wave the magic wand and say, well, with natural selection and enough time, it works. And so, let's be honest, both sides have some issues where we just say, yeah, it works. And so we've got that, but let's look at the idea of a designer. Everything I know that's designed has a designer. And again, I have to really do some hard convincing to convince myself that the world and the universe is not well designed because it's extremely well put together. And so am I going to just pretend that it looks like a design? And not just a design, but man, as you study biology, I teach physics because te teaching physics is, physics is the absolute best science to teach. It is so much fun. We get to do so many fun things. But I actually have way more hours in biology than I do in physics. So anyway, when you study biology and you study the way life works and you study what's happening inside your body, you can't help but say, wow, this is just so amazingly complex. And your body knows what to do. Your cells know which DNA to turn on and which DNA to turn off because, you know, your skin cell and your liver cell and your stomach cell all have the same DNA in them, but the stomach doesn't try and be a liver cell, and the skin doesn't try and be a liver cell. If it does, we call it cancer. Um, too often naturalists act like there's absolutely no faith to their point of view, when there's an incredible amount of faith, way more faith than I need to have in God. So <clears throat> the other part that bothers me is throughout time, Everyone has always assumed that there is a God because it's overwhelmingly obvious that there is a designer. It's overwhelmingly obvious that all this stuff had to come from somewhere. It's overwhelmingly obvious <clears throat> that there's somebody here. Um, I think a guy named Paul wrote about that. But, <clears throat> yeah, people act nowadays like you have to prove that God exists. When really, you got to flip that around. Really? I think you need to prove that God doesn't exist. And so then when you start asking people, where did all this stuff come from? Show me how life came from that way. Show them this stuff. Because if you can show me this stuff, I, I, then your case is a little stronger, but right now you're grasping at straws. Um, what I like about God's story is he doesn't cover the gaps. He provides that framework for understanding. So he provides a worldview that predicts what we actually see. He provides a worldview that works for me. Then you get the idea that, okay, if I'm convinced there is a God, which God? There's a lot of different people that claim a lot of different things about God. And so you get people that say, well, all these ideas about God can't be right. So they must be all wrong. Again, is that good logic? Now, there are some that, yes, they're so patently, absurdly bad that you can pretty much cross them off your list. But... We get to our God, and suddenly it, it's, it's a little different. The Bible is one of the things that convinced me that the framework over here is right. The Bible is an amazing book. Forty different authors written over 1,600 time, year time period. You take your typical author of scientific literature, and his early work and his late work contradict each other tremendously. Here we've got these authors that are from widely different points of view in time and in life and in what they do for a living and where they are and what their education level is. And all their writings are in perfect harmony and perfect agreement. And the more I study the Bible, the more I'm amazed by this book. <clears throat> and the stuff that I thought I could just take on faith 
that didn't have the stuff to back it up. When you start researching it more and more and more, you find out this is amazing. And you're going to learn more about that later today. So <clears throat> I get to be kind of an intro to a lot of these other guys. Then we have the false hope of works, <clears throat> which God. Most religions in the world say that there is some angry God out there that you have to appease. That you have to be out there and you have to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and you have to make yourself better and you're going to make it work. And I look at a God like that and I say, what's the point of you being there? Why would I even worship a God where you're just telling me to, hey, buck up, do it yourself, when I know I can't? It's like I heard about a college kid who read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and he says, yeah, it's beautiful platitudes that nobody can live up to. That was the point of the Sermon on the Mount, was to tell you this is the way you should live, and you're not doing it. And so if you're living in a workspace salvation, you're in trouble, but the good news is, the God of the Bible says it's not a workspace salvation. It's, <clears throat> I come and take you. The Bible uses the adoption a lot. It says that we are adopted into the family of God. Now, adoption, <clears throat> sorry. I get emotional about adoption. I have six kids. Um, four of them are adopted. <clears throat> My four adopted kids lived half a world away. Never met them before. I had to pay the cost for their adoption, pay the cost to bring them here, make them part of my family. They are 100% my family. They have all the rights and privileges of my two natural-born children. They are going to be my kids their entire life. They are stuck with the name Paulson. When they came here, did they know what it meant to be a Paulson? The answer is no. They didn't even know English. <laughs> they had no idea what it meant to be a Paulson. In fact, my son... I had sent pictures to Africa to him and so he could see me. And one of them, I was wearing a bandana. And the only time he had ever seen somebody wearing a bandana on their head was in American movies where they were a drug dealer. And so he thought, maybe he's a drug dealer. <laughs> and so he had all these misconceptions of what I was and who I was. And he had no idea what it meant to be a Paulson. And 11 years later, he represents the Paulson name pretty well. He knows what it means to be a Paulson. He knows what's expected of him, and he lives up to his expectations. This is the way God designed you and me. God grabbed you and paid 100% of the penalty. My kids did nothing to get out of Africa. I paid all the stuff to get them here. They did nothing to get into my family. The cost was borne by me. So, in the same way, God took you and said, I'm going to take you pitiful and lost and helpless and hopeless. And I'm going to make you my family. And I'm going to make you mine. It also says that we were dead in our sins. If you are dead in your sins, what can you do to reanimate yourself? Nothing. So some outside agent needs to reanimate you. So this idea of works is going to get you into heaven is such a false idea. So where do works fit in? How do my kids know how to be a Paulson? Trial and error and instruction. How do you know what it's like to be a child of God? God has already paid that penalty for you and allowed you to become his child. The rest of your life is figuring out what does that look like? How do I please my father? How do I do the things that make him happy? So that's where works fit in. I want to please my father who loves me, who will never abandon me. Not I need to appease an angry God that might zop me out at any moment. That's such a false view of God and not a biblical view at all. <clears throat> contentment. My God teaches me contentment. 
my God teaches me that I don't need the latest and greatest stuff. I don't need a title to my name. I need him. So which of the worldviews is superior? Going back to those questions, where did all this stuff come from? Magic or creator, designer God who is beyond the stuff that we have? Someone who is not physical, that can create the physical. Which one makes more sense? How did life arrive? Did life, even though all the data says life can't come from non-life, well, it must have happened because we're here, so it did happen. And even though it doesn't make sense, we're here, so it must have happened. Um, is there a purpose to life? Well, from the naturalistic point of view, our purpose to life is pretty dim. It's just to survive. So why do I care about kids in Africa if all I want to do is survive? I'm more genetically related to other people. So that should be more important to me. Um, I like the purpose to life in God's point of view. I like to make the world better. Why is there evil? From a naturalistic point of view, there is no evil. It may seem evil to you, but in some cultures it's good. This is the explanation we get. When you know deep down in the core of who you are that some things are just wrong. And everybody knows that. Are we alone? Scientists spend millions of dollars looking throughout the universe saying, is there anything out there? And they miss the incredible design of the universe to say, no, we're not alone. We have this creator God who is looking over us and didn't leave us as orphans, but came and adopted us. Does anything matter? Their worldview? Sorry, nothing matters. There is no ultimate purpose. You're just an accident of evolution. So, eat, drink, and be merry. Get what you get. Doesn't matter how you get it. You only got one life. Have fun with it. <coughs> Ramifications comes down to, what if I'm wrong? If I'm completely wrong, then while I wasted my life serving other people, being content, feeling loved, surrounding myself with a family, feeling like I had a purpose and meaning in life. Gee, that's a horrible way to go. What if I'm right? If I'm right, then the Bible says there's a judgment, and this judgment will happen, and this judgment is sure. And I can prevent that judgment just by saying yes to the most incredible gift ever offered, that the creator God of the universe would put on flesh and become a man and become the sacrifice that takes out the penalty that I deserve to take. And they're rejecting that out of arrogance and saying, there is no God. I'm doing it my way. I'd hate for them to be wrong. Anyway, if you have more questions that you want to answer me that don't get answered today or you just want to have a dialogue, my email address is really hard to remember. Steve Paulson at stevepaulson.com. So... Thank you for listening.